And my name is Alice. I have a super long double last name uh, because I chose not to give up my maiden name. I am a mastermind guide. I've been guiding since I was 18, but not all of it in the state of Maine. I own a company called Alice's Awesome Adventures, among others. And that happens to be my website. So I do do trainings. And for some of you, I may become your trainer, mentor, friend, and nudge. So this is recorded. There will be time at the end for you to ask questions. I will stay on in order to answer everybody's questions as best I can. If I haven't answered them through the presentation, you are also welcome to put questions up in chat so that I see them and answer them as best I can while I'm still talking. Does that make sense to everybody? Because we're likely to have as many as 50 or more people in this presentation, I'm going to ask you to stay muted until we're at the end, just so that we're not talking on top of me. So here we go. Some of us don't know what a registered main guide is. We've heard about them. We're not too sure. Our nickname is an RMG. I happen to be an MMG only because I'm a master main guide, but that's its abbreviation. By law, a registered main guide is someone who has been granted permission by the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and possibly the Maine Department of Marine Resources if you do tidal water guiding to lead people or clients or sports or guests or participants into and on the water and lands of the state of Maine for any remuneration. So if in a technical point of view is that if you have got a whole bunch of you that have decided to go out on a trip somewhere in the woods or trails of Maine and Everybody asked you to plan the trip, and they decide that because you did so much work, they're going to buy you a $100 gift card and give it to you at the end. That is remuneration, and that is guiding. And so technically, you need to be a registering guide in order to have that happen. The requirement by Maine Inland uh, fisheries and wildlife is that all trips must be enjoyable, safe, and legal. They consider a registered Maine guide as a protector of Maine's wildlife species, their flora and fauna, the environment, and we must follow legal rules. So if I happen to be out fishing, but I am not a fishing guide, that's okay, but I can't help anybody to guide fishing. I can't give them any hints. I can give myself hints, maybe. On the other hand, if I am only a recreation guide, and this will become more important in a couple of minutes, I see somebody who is fishing as part of my party, and I'm not a fishing guide, but I know that the rule for landing a particular fish is that the fish needs to be a certain size and I can only use certain bait or lures for that fish, then I must, even though I'm not a fishing guide, talk to my guest and say, oh, by the way, you cannot or you can keep that fish based on that. Your renewal of your license is not automatic. And if it's granted, it will be for five December 31st. Currently that cost is $135 plus a new fingerprint background check. So what do you need to do to actually test? The first thing you need to do is choose a specialty or multiple specialties. And the specialties are known as hunting, fishing, recreation, sea kayaking, tidewater fishing, and whitewater rafting. When you apply, you are going to be stating 
and then signing a signature to it that you have at least three years experience in each of your chosen specialties. You are required to send a copy of your current first aid certificate and it needs to be first aid and CPR. And to be honest, it really needs to be good for another six months beyond your actual application date. And the reason for that is that it's possible that you apply, your application gets sent back or there's a delay because your fingerprint check wasn't done or they're backed up. And in order to grant your license, your first aid and CPR must still be current. You are going to need to get a fingerprint background check. It has to be unique for inland fisheries and wildlife. If you work currently in a job such as being a teacher where you had to have a fingerprint background check, that doesn't count. You have to have a brand new one. Even if you had one done for teaching two weeks ago, you have to have a brand new one done specifically for IFNW. That has to be done first before you can apply. And the general rule currently is you must wait six weeks after your fingerprint background check to apply. When you do apply, it's going to cost you $100 per specialty. And once you get your test date, which currently is coming by email, don't miss it. There are some common skills that every specialty overlaps on. So just because you might want to be a hunting guide that is only going to do upland birds and you're only going to do it for, you know, one morning a week and you can drive to it and come back, you're still going to be tested on understanding camping both overnight remote areas and other areas, your cooking skills using campfires and uh, stoves, your paddling skills, canoeing, kayak, and sup. Kayak is primarily for tidewater um, work, but there are, you could get questions on kayaking if you're doing fishing. Everybody with pretty much gets now asked questions on stand-up paddle boarding, map and compass, coastal navigation for sea kayak, tidewater fishing and hunting, first aid skills, and your first aid class may only be what they require, which is a American Red Cross or American Heart Association basic first aid course, simple one, that includes the CPR. It is, most guides will tell you that that doesn't go far enough because almost everything they do is have you identify that there's a problem and then call for 911 for a response. But most of us guide in areas that we are more than 20 minutes away from a quick response. So that wilderness first aid is a preferred preferred first aid course if you can get it. Uh, it's a minimum of two days. It can be as long as a week for the advanced versions of it. Not required to apply, but better first aid skills than simply calling 911 would be advantageous. You need to know the laws. You need to know all the wildlife laws, boating laws, fire permits, land access permission laws, the use of ATVs and their laws, the use of snowmobiles and their laws, fishing and hunting laws. And you really ought to know how to do equipment repair and maintenance. That sometimes is taught while you're working. So what are the specialties again? Hunting, fishing, recreation, sea kayaking, tidewater fishing, whitewater rafting. So I'm going to explain them. For hunting, it has a nice big umbrella. So you could be leading trips for mammals that are small game or large game, upland birds, turkey, migratory birds, 
the use of trapping as part of hunting, and the use of dogs. These trips can be on land or on water or a combination thereof. They can be short, half day, all day, or a multi-day trip. Camping, ATV, and boating experience is quite important. A lot of hunting guides do work for outfitters or work out of lodges when they're doing mammals such as deer and bear, but there are many that work independently and not for another outfitter. It's probably for some people the most fun of all the specialties in that there's a purpose and you're really hoping with fingers crossed all the time that your sport that's out with you in fact gets the quarry that they've been after. Fishing is definitely inland waters only. That is what fishing is. You can take people out or bring them to rivers and streams, ponds and lakes. You can fish from shore, from a canoe, a kayak, a stand-up paddleboard, or float fishing. You can float, you can fish from a motorboat. You can fish for cold water fish, warm water fish, ice fishing, which is what everybody's doing right now, preferably not falling through the ice because they forgot to measure the ice, fly fishing, bait casting. You might have short days, long days, or in the morning, take a break in the afternoon so that you can really work when the fish are most active in the area that you're gonna be, or multi-day trips. Most often, multi-day trips are again done through an outfitter, but there are some guides that have the ability to self-support themselves and they'll do a multi-day trip. You may need ATV and snowmobile experience to access some of the very back and most remote fishing spots, or you may have hired a float plane to bring you into some of those and bring you back. Recreation is probably the hardest one to wrap your head around in that it's not as specific as hunting or fishing. It includes hiking, biking, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, dog sledding, the use of ATVs to go into remote areas and taking people to see different wildlife or flora and fauna. The use of snowmobiles, canoeing, kayaking, and sub trips, part time, short trips, all day trips, multi day trips, whitewater canoeing, and whitewater supping, not rafting, canoeing. You could use kayaks for the whitewater as well, and that would be still under the recreational umbrella. Horseback trips, wildlife watching trips, photography trips, forest bathing and yoga in remote areas, as well as there's some people that are starting to do remote truck trekking tours. So you can't present yourself to Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and say, all I want to do is trips that are going to be hiking uh, in the 100-mile wilderness and expect them not to ask you questions about ATVing or canoeing and stand-up paddleboarding or whitewater canoeing or all those other parts because they're going to ask you all of that. Sea kayaking, by definition, by inland fisheries and wildlife is specific to tidal waters. And the trick with uh, sea kayaking is that if you want to use the sea, whoops, if you want to use the sea kayak on inland waters, that's fine. Anybody who has a recreation guides license can do that. 
You don't have to have, nor would you use, a sea kayak license to do that. But you need to understand where tidal waters are. And the easiest way to figure that out is you need to get out the fishing rules. So the Kennebec River, anything from below where the Edwards Dam used to be requires a sea kayak license. So the lower part of the Kennebec River, going from Augusta down, if you wanted to go around Swans Island or over to Swans Island, you would need to be a sea kayak guide. If you wanted to go into Meeting Bay, you need to be a sea kayaking guide. If you want to continue down the Kennebec River out to um, and go out to Seguin Island, that's all being a sea kayak guide. Even if you choose to use a canoe, even if you choose to use a sit on top kayak, a stand up paddle board, or traditional, like the picture is, sea kayaks. If you want to be in an area like Brunswick, which has tidal waters as well as non-tidal waters, then you're probably gonna want to get both your sea kayak and your recreation guides license. So you don't have to think about which waters that you're gonna be on. You can be in protected coastal waters. You can be on the tidal rivers like the Kennebec or the Androscoggin or any numbers of others. You can offer trips through surf and you can offer trips that are offshore waters as long as you are within three miles of land. You can offer half day, full day and overnight trips. Tidewater fishing is definitely a unique specialty. Most people use the boat like the Ruby Bell or some other size, larger fishing boat. It's on, it, tidewater fishing is just like its name, only on tidal waters. But people also use sit on top kayaks, stand up paddle boards, sea kayaks, wreck kayaks, motorized boats that are much smaller or larger. It must be on tidal rivers or tidal marshes or coastal waters. You can stand on shore and fish, stand on a breakwater and fish, but if you're guiding that kind of fishing, you need to be a tidewater fishing guide. You must be within the coal regs line. And if you don't know what that is, come take a coastal navigation class with me. Most people who get a tidewater fishing license also get a U.S. Coast Guard captain's license. And it's so that they can take more people than six and they can use larger boats. But if you're only going to be using a sea kayak or a wreck kayak or a sit on top that's pedal powered, whatever, if you're only gonna be doing that, then you only need to be a tidewater fishing guide. Again, you cannot be greater than three miles from shore, nor do I think you'd want to be if you're using a sit on top kayak. Whitewater rafting is a unique specialty within the uh, total of six specialties. It is the only one where you must train with a whitewater rafting company. It is an apprenticeship training. You go through their training, you complete their apprenticeship to their trainer's satisfaction. You then apply to the state to take a written exam, which includes your knowledge of whitewater rafting and guiding in general. It is a much shorter period license. It's only good for three years or three December 31st, not five December 31st. And you are not supposed to be guiding in canoes or sea kayaks or kayaks in general. You are limited to using whitewater rafts. 
So when I do training, I don't offer that because I'm not set up to do that kind of apprenticeship. For those of you that are 16 and still enrolled in high school, we have an incredible opportunity for you. If you use that QR code, so take a picture of it now with your phone. I'm going to leave it up for a little while. You could be selected to attend a training. It's a weekend training from May 2nd through the 5th at no cost to you. If you happen to be 18 to 24, but have graduated high school, there is another one of these very unique specialty weekends that is June 20th to 23rd. And there's a different QR code that gets you to the application. Maine Tourism Association has created these working with a very special whitewater rafting company. And this is an incredible opportunity. Quite honestly, I would be applying to do this if I were significantly younger than I am right now. This is gonna come back up. So I'm going to pause this. Actually, I'm going to stop the share for a minute and I'm going to go out and ask you to try to do a poll. This one's got seven questions for it. And if everybody would just read the question, the first one is, I'm getting information about the Registered Gate Main Guide training process tonight. Pick one, there's different questions, answers. The second question is, I want to become a registered main guide in 2024. I'm really curious to see what you're thinking. The third one is, there are three different, um, there are different specialties that a registered main guide could become, which even if you're not planning to train, Pick the three that interest you the most. So even if you're not planning to train right now, all six of them are listed. If you could give me a sense of what age group you're in, that would be helpful. Five is an uh, honesty question. I've got at least three years active outdoor experience in my chosen specialties, at least one of the ones that you picked earlier. The sixth one is I have current first aid and CPR certificate. And the seventh one is the full scholarship application requires candidates to have at least one of these qualifications, be between 18 to 24, identify as BIPOC, have not finished a college education. So if you're thinking that you might want to apply for the scholarship, please do, or say that you're not. Right now we've got 16 of 24 who have answered back. Thank you very much for taking the time to do this. I'll give it about 30 more seconds in case someone's in the process of doing it. Alice, there was a question in the in the chat, um, maybe while everybody's finishing up, what qualifies as experience? So experience, according to IFNW, is that you have actively participated in that sport or that specialty in different parts over three years. So if you have gone whitewater rafting once in your lifetime, but and then that wouldn't qualify. If you have gone out hiking off and on at least five or six times over five or more years, that would qualify. But you have to 
believe is that you feel very strongly that you have a strength in that area and that you could lead others in that specialty. The hard part is that there are outfitters that bring in specialists from outside the state of Maine for one summer, and they may or may not have any sea kayak experience, and yet they're going to give them a one-week training and say, okay, we need you to do hiking, but we're going to be using sea kayaks too, so we're going to get you trained as a sea kayak guide too, and so everybody is sort of lying through their teeth through that one, and it makes it painful, at least for the rest of us. So I'm going to end the poll, and I'm going to share the results just so everybody can see what's going on. And if you can't see what's on here, let me know, because right now we should be able to see this. 55% um, of you aren't try quite sure when you might train. And that is a very normal answer to this question. 41% of you have a plan that you really think that you might want to do this sooner than later, which is great. And one of you said, I just want to learn. I just want to see what's going on. And my hope is that because that you have learned about the training process, you can help friends to make the decision because you came to tonight's session. Other people who said, I do want to become a registered main guide, 59% of you have decided that this year is the good year to do it. Personally, I think it's a great year to do it. Recreation is the most popular one. This is not unusual. And right behind that is sea kayaking. Again, not unusual to be 32%. And then it's pretty much equally split between hunting and fishing. Uh, being the next ones after that. A long, long, long time ago, everybody wanted to be a hunting guide, a fishing guide, and a recreation guide. And that allowed you to do so much more. Nowadays, you tend to do hunting and fishing, maybe rec, or sea kayak and recreation, so you don't have to pay attention to the water you're on. Uh, fewer people want to do tidewater fishing and there seems to be at least three of you who are interested in doing whitewater rafting which is very exciting to me whitewater rafting companies are begging for new staff we've got uh 18 percent or four of you that are between 17 and 21 four of you that are between 22 and 39. A good majority of you are between 40 and 65 and some are over. Here's what I know from training all kinds of people of all different ages for a very long time is that I worry. And so I'm going to talk to the people who are younger, younger than 40. When you get your license, you may be doing it just to become a guide for a summer or for a few summers. It's your summer job in between college years or in between high school and college. And then you go off and do something else. Well, the main outdoor industry desperately needs you to stay here and take on other parts of the industry and stay in it. There's more jobs than just guiding. There's working in the resorts. There's working both as uh, technical staff, maybe working the ski lifts, working the ski slopes. Maybe it's working in the food service area or repair gear. It may be that you are wickedly talented in designing and you need to come and work for our manufacturers but there's jobs here year round. But whatever you do, even if it takes you out of the state of Maine, those of you that are between 17 and 39, 
please, once you become a registered Maine guide, do not let your license go. It is the cheapest $135 for five December 31st license that you want. Because what you don't want to do is have been a guide, let it go, and suddenly decide uh, sometime near retirement or by the time you're sometime over 40 or 50, you want to become a guide and you have to go through the whole training program all over again. And oh, by the way, the rules have changed. It is very painful for people who are choosing to do it for the first time that are in that 40 to 65 or over 65 age group. You usually don't let your license go, but it's our young people that do and then they come back and they want to do it. So three years active, um, it doesn't have to be. So if you want to do fishing, if you've only done fly fishing your whole life, that's okay. That's more than three years active experience, but you may want to uh, pull up a different kind of rod so that you can learn how to teach that. At least answer questions in it. It's great that we're about evenly split with the current first aid and CPR certificate. So not some of the training programs offer a first aid and CPR certificate as part of the training. Some don't, I don't because they're available and I'm focused on something else. So that's uh, an interesting part of it. So start looking for those classes. Adult education programs are great places. Certain work sites offer them as well. And you can also go on to inland um, the uh, American Red Cross and the American Heart Association websites and find classes as well. So there's three of you that absolutely know that you're intending to apply for a scholarship tonight. And 19 of you are not planning to apply for a scholarship tonight because maybe you don't meet any of the requirements and that's all good. So let me go back to what I was sharing before. Alice, before you do that, we have a question in the chat. If you're a registered Maine guide and you want to do a trip out of the state, what are the rules on that? Okay, can let me read it. Let me read the chat question okay. so I can answer it right. Okay, so it depends on what state you're going to. Totally. Um, if you're going into New Hampshire, see, the person didn't tell me what specialty, so specialties matter. So if you're going into New Hampshire and you want to guide, if you're trying to guide fishing or hunting, you have to become a licensed guide with the state of New Hampshire and their program is totally different from the state of Maine. If you are going to Colorado and you want to guide on, for example, through the Grand Canyon, then you and you're planning to use canoes or not a raft, then you still have to get qualified by the um, by Colorado. If you're going up into Alaska, even in recreation, because there are so many things that you can do under the recreation specialty, you are going to have to check in with that state. But if you're gonna to go to Vermont, and all you're gonna do is lead a hiking trip. Um, Vermont has very few water lakes and uh, rivers short of Lake Champlain, then you don't need to do anything. You just have to make sure that you've got insurance and that you've got everything set up with gear or check in with others. Does that help? Super. Okay, so here are the primary ways to train. 
a lot of people do self-training. You work at your own pace. You take workshops whenever you feel you're um, interested in something. You can be taking workshops from all kinds of different sources. I'm going to show you in a couple minutes. You could ask friends for help. Maybe you've got a friend that knows how to snowshoe and you've never been snowshoeing. It's a great time to ask them to show you how to snowshoe. It's great for people who have strong backgrounds or have guided in other states. Rather than take a formal guide school training course, just um, come in, read what Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has up. It's minimal information, but it's a good way to do it. You might want to take some mock oral or written exam preparations with a school just to make sure that you've got all the parts for the specialty or specialties that you want to do. The other way to train, which is what a good number of people choose to do, is they go through a guide school. If you go through the main Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife website, they will give you a list of all the guide schools. There is a big difference between them. Many of them offer a two or three day general guide training course. They are very intense. They're short courses. Primarily they're focused on hunting and fishing with a little bit about wreck. If you are interested in tidewater fishing or whitewater rafting or sea kayaking, most of those schools don't offer that kind of training. That's not what they're set up for. Uh, the AAA stands for Alice's Awesome Adventures. I offer adult education programs and specialty group training. The main Tourism Association is a specialty group training. It's multi-week so that you spend longer time learning the information, but you also retain it. The skill practice is optional, but highly encouraged. They're, these programs have a minimum of three all-day outdoor skill practices. And I offer five specialties and truly train to all five. I cannot do and will not do whitewater rafting. I also offer private training. So if you don't think you can do a group class and you can't do a weekend class and you're you decide you want to do this in the middle of the summer, then you contact me directly and we set up a flexible schedule. All the skill training, mock oral and written exams and some other stuff is all included. Um, I have a question. Yes. Okay, so... Um... I've lived off grid for 10 years. I hunt at times. I fish. I grow my own vegetables. I'm also a chef. Is there anywhere that I would fit in? You might fit into a recreation guide training. But it depends on what kind of opportunities you and experiences you want to offer those people that are coming if you're just bringing them to your site where you're living and you are uh, teaching them how to cook off grid or you're teaching about how to grow vegetables that doesn't require you to be a registered main guide Okay, but is there jobs that I can get where I can do those type of things without having to get registered? If you're just offering workshops on cooking or living off the grid, you don't need to be a registered main guide. Yeah, but is there, there are jobs for that? Possibly. Um, I can suggest a couple agencies that might like to have you list what you create. Um, but can I wait till the tail end of this and talk to you about that? 
Yeah. Sorry, Thanks. my voice is a little rough. I've been sick for a couple of weeks. Okay, just sort of stay on at the end and I will help you with that. So some other non-formal training methods, taking individual adult education uh, courses, taking uh, workshops by inland fisheries and wildlife, such as their bow program, which is becoming an outdoor woman, or going to an event that they're doing. Teens to Trails offers some incredible training. Uh, the Appalachian Mountain Club and other groups like them uh, Maine Island Trail Association, some of the other uh, land trusts offer some incredible workshops that people will go and take. Sometimes they cost money, sometimes they don't. Guide companies, they hire you as an employee. You might be hired just to do their greeting or you might be hired to do be their driver or something like that, but they offer training for people through it uh, that helps keep everybody else uh, going. They usually include everybody in the skills training as well because they want you to be able to answer questions for their guests. And while you may not be qualified at that time, this is a way to start working in the industry and to come in. You might have somebody who is someone like me, who's a guide and they offered to do a mentorship for you. But until you become an actual registered main guide, you can't lead any trips or give guiding information. You are literally the, might be the 12th person on that trip. So you're, going along, you're seeing, you're possibly helping, unloading stuff, reloading stuff, but you can't give out, you can't lead the trip, you can't assist uh, guests while they're in the middle of the trip or give guiding information, or you can take a private uh, type of private training. There are some very sobering facts. If you take training that does not include skills practice and you're relying on what you already know and you haven't taken a formal training, you might or might not know correct or current skills. And I run into this a lot when I take people out canoeing. They think they know how to do current canoe strokes and they don't. You might be unskilled or unsafe if there were a catastrophic event, such as uh, a wind comes up and all the boats capsize, or you've had someone get electrocuted. If you don't know what to be doing, you might have a problem. Often 70% of the people fail their first attempt at their exams in Augusta and often 40% fail their second attempt because they didn't have skills practice and they have tried to memorize the answers to questions, which is also on the other side too. Training that is focused, very intense training is often focused on rules and laws. Learning the flora and fauna identification is poor. Mastering navigation, whether it be map and compass or coastal navigation is low and you're not really trained how to guide, but you are focused on answering questions to the test and it's fine. And what outfitters often do is for someone who manages to pass, they then put you to be paired with another more seasoned guide for part of the season or possibly the whole season. And you're working as sort of a junior guide. You're fully a registered main guide, but they that outfitter doesn't believe that they can trust you when they first hire you to do that. There are costs involved in becoming a registered main guide. The fixed costs are the IFNW costs. It's going to cost you $55 to get your fingerprint background check done. 
it is going to cost you $100 per specialty to apply to test. If you fail twice, you have to reapply. You must bring a new, brand new, unmarked main gazetteer to your exams. And depending on where you get them, they will cost between $25 and $30. And when you pass, you are going to pay for your guides license, which is good for 5 December 31st. So if you test in 2024 and you pass, your guides license will expire on December 31st, 2028, because 2024, 25, 26, 27, 28 is the 5th, December 31st. The other cost, depending on how you do it, you may have first aid and CPR training costs. You may have specialty training, take a registered main guide training course. Almost always you're going to be buying books if you can't get them out of the library. You may need to buy equipment, uh, little things like compasses or a set of parallel rulers and dividers. You may need something else. You should also be aware that you may incur cost for transportation and meals to go to training, like a three-day weekend training. You may be in the far reaches of the state of Maine, and you're going to be driving five plus hours to Augusta to test, and your test is at eight o'clock in the morning. You may want to come down the day before so there's transportation and meals to testing as well. And once you become a guide, you, most guides want to get insurance for guiding and that can cost between $1,400 and $3,000 a year. If you are working for an outfitter, they cover you. But if you want to work independently, then you really should have got insurance as well. A lot of people go to work for outfitters, so they're covered initially. So here's what's coming. Starting on the 9th of February, which is a Friday night, there is a Maine Tourism Association sponsored training. We meet for 10 sessions by Zoom on Friday evenings. It's three hours per session, it's 5.30 to 8.30. And unlike this night where you really aren't doing much and I'm doing all the talking, there's it's totally interactive and you won't realize the time has gone by. There is weekly homework. There are no classes on February 23rd and April 19th. And while there's no makeup for the classes, there is, I do attempt to record them so that there is in fact a recording for you to see. I leave it up for about a week. There are three optional all day, but highly critical group skills workshops. They're in Brunswick. The first one is on March 2nd. It's winter skills, compass and cooking. Normal price for it is 125 at 75. If you're uh, anyway, just hold on to that. There is a canoeing and stand-up paddleboard workshop on Saturday, April 20th. I need the water to be not frozen. And there is a sea kayak skills workshop all day on the following Saturday on the 27th. When I do my training, I ask people to pick one, no more than two specialties to focus on. Yes, you can test for more specialties if you want, but if you can stay focused on one or two, it makes the training work better. The course focus is on you becoming and being a guide, not just a test taker. So from the first night, all the training is asking questions and having you learn from the answers and helping you think like a guide so that 
you aren't just memorizing facts and figures. If you're going to be paying for yourself, you're going to use that link and uh, that's going to pop up in chat shortly. If it isn't already. And there is a scholarship program for up to 15 people. And I want to thank Maine Tourism Association for going to the effort of getting grant money for this. Priority is given for meeting at least one of these special uh, these requirements that your age is between 18 and 24, that perhaps you identify as black indigenous or a person of color, and that you have not completed a college education. This is a scholarship, so you will need to apply by noon on February 2nd. You can either use the link, which is bit.ly forward slash M-A-I-N-E-G-U-I-D-E 24, or you can use the QR code that's sitting right there. Those that apply and um, up to 15 people will be chosen. Anyone that is chosen will be notified by the 5th of February so that you will be ready to start training that Friday. So it's a very short time frame. This is the link for this is up in chat. And for those who don't immediately qualify, for applying for scholarship. It is a $500 online course textbook for the 10 Zoom sessions um, coming through and so forth. You can do that through Navitur. The workshops are separate, so you can choose to do all three. You can choose to do one. That's your choice or none. And we have only five spaces open for that. And the bit.ly link for that is um, bit.ly forward slash uppercase m-t-a-r-m-g. And if you go into the chat, um, it'll be there. But I'm also going to bring them back up so you can take pictures of it. There we go. And then just because I'm doing the talk, I do specialty uh, workshops, which can be arranged with your schedule and mine. I do private mock oral exams. It's three and a half hours per specialty. I do full private training. It's a hybrid training, so it's meeting online with me one-to-one -one weekly for 90 minutes, plus joining the workshops and having all the other stuff. It's pricey, but it's private training. So I'm going to try, yeah, to bring this up. And you should see a th three question poll. And I'm going to try to get you into the whole thought of being a registered main guide. And I just want you to believe that on Saturday, we have a snow, wet, weather, windy event. And you have an event scheduled that day. And you have eight people planned for that day. The first question is, when should you contact your registrants, the people that are coming to your event, about the weather? You only get to choose one choice. The day of the event, one day before the event, two days before the event, or as soon as you realize that the weather isn't going to be what you expected. In the second question, it's the same trip, however, 
you haven't yet canceled the trip because you're you've chosen regardless of what you chose before you've chosen to wait until the evening before the trip your cancellation policy is that if the guest cancels within seven days of the trip on their own there is no refund however if you cancel the trip even up to the moment of meeting your guests, you will refund their fees. Two of the people cancel more than five days before the trip because they're worried about the weather. You do cancel the trip the night before the actual trip. Should you refund those people's fees? Yes or no? Can everybody see? Yep. So we've got two people who are feeling brave. And we got three. Be brave, pick an answer, even if it's hard. Okay, I've got 20, yep, super cool. So I'm gonna end the poll so that we can just talk about it. And I'm sharing the results. I'm so glad that everybody chose not to first contact your registrants about the weather the day of the event. One day before is sometimes a little bit difficult, but it depends on how much that weather event is. Two or more days is what would be smart because your people may not have clothing for the correct weather. So the more days that you can warn them that the beautiful, sunny, warm, hot, warm to hot day trip that you were planning isn't going to happen, the better they can prepare for it. When it gets down to the second question, you know, do you or do you not refund the early cancellations as well? That may or may not be your choice. And I say that in a kind way because the outfitter may have chosen that if people cancel, they cancel, they don't get a refund if they're within the five day time. And other outfitters will say, yes, I'm gonna refund the early cancellations as well because I canceled the trip. So I can't tell you what's the right answer. And that's one of the things that you have to understand about guiding is there sometimes there isn't a right answer, but there's understanding of why refunding would be the better thing to do or not refunding is the better thing to do. If the weather changed in the moment, you know, you met everybody, you hadn't canceled, but then the, you're there and you cancel, that might be a reason to give them back the money. But on the other hand, you might choose to do something else. So it has to depend. If I work for an outfitter and I'm an employee, I need to follow their policy, whatever it is. And sometimes that leaves me with egg on my face because I may not agree with what they have chosen but i'm working for them and i can talk to them about it later and so now we've got 
how do you want to train if you were to train? Uh, group class seems to be the winner at the moment. As far as six of you, four of you think you can do it on your own. And I do hope that you can do it just great because it's not, it's the technical parts that sometimes will get you. And nine of you aren't quite sure. And that is pretty normal. So let me get rid of the, oops, let me get rid of this. So that's my contact information if you need it. And I'll get to chat in just a minute. So that's there. This is the very, very special. So I promised that I would pop it back up. And uh, give you a chance to use your phone and uh, go on one of these very special weekend whitewater rafting trips. So uh, my name is Catherine. I'm with the Maine Tourism Association. So we're the ones sponsoring the the scholarships and, and we're the ones uh, scheduling this class. If you are having trouble with the QR code, um, I'm going to pop my email in the chat. Uh, you can email me if you have any questions about the scholarship. You can email me. I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'm just going to pop that in there. Um, so if, if these QR codes aren't working for you or anything, just let me know. Catherine, can you say your email address for the recording, please? Absolutely. It's K Ferentz, that's F, like Frank, E-R-E-N-C-E, at maintourism.com. So K Ferentz at maintourism.com. So I've got somebody on who's asking, um, who's um, 14, who is interested in becoming a game warden, and would I recommend that she take registered main guide training and get her license for that as well? And then when should she pursue that? So one of the things that you are gonna want to do is to take workshops through Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, such as the Becoming an Outdoor Woman program, because you're gonna meet those game wardens because they're there training. And so you're going to be able to ask them all kinds of wonderful questions. The main wardens uh, division also has hires people to work, perhaps as um, they've changed the name again. It used to be junior wardens, uh, but it, there's a new name for this person. And so they're not old enough to become a game warden. They are old enough, however, to go out and do testing on fish population or check licenses or to do certain things. And it's a summer job. And again, that gives you that kind of training. And eventually you are gonna become a registered main guide. Most of the game wardens have come through uh, their application process because they were a registered main guide and had a chance to lead people so that they can do that. The more wild, um, the more that you have experience in using an ATV, a snowmobile, hiking, uh, biking, mountain biking, fishing, hunting, all of those pursuits you're going to need before you become a game warden. So that's all part of that, uh, that's most of that. So Catherine was very, very kind and she gave her email address so that you can do that. And I'm just gonna stay here. Here's the bit.ly link for the application. It's bit.ly forward slash M-A-I-N-E-G-U-I-D-E 24. 
And that's for the scholarship application. Again, if you're going to uh, think about doing that, you want to apply by noon on February 2nd. And if you think you're going to pay, you want to use uppercase letters for the bit.ly link, which is bit.ly forward slash uppercase M-T-A-R-M-G. And that'll take you to Navitor where you can register. For those who are debating about the whole thing, if you want to work this summer as a registered main guide, if you don't take this training, which is perfectly fine, it may not meet your schedules, and you take training with another way, or you train on your own. If you want to test in spring, this, this is when you want to do that training. And you're going to want to get your fingerprint background check done no later than the 1st of March because you have to wait six weeks before you can send in your application. So six weeks after the 1st of March is the middle of April. Because inland fisheries and wildlife will be very overwhelmed, like every year during the months of April, May, and June, you may end up having to wait four months before you get a test date. If you don't pass your first attempt, you probably will miss the whole season. If you test in April, May, or June, if by chance you don't pass the first time, you have to wait 31 days before you can have another test date. And because they're so overloaded with incoming applications, which they also have to schedule in, it can be quite frustrating. And I don't have anything I can do to help with that. Um, whoops. I guess that's because I put Catherine's in before. So I'm going to stay. If anybody's got questions, uh, please stay. You can unmute and ask the questions. I'll do my very best to answer them. Otherwise, I want to thank you all for coming. <laughs>